pandemic took us by surprise and our lives have been altered forever. For Christians, the situation we're in touches one of the most sensitive nerves of the faith. How do we account for horrible suffering, even innocent suffering, in a world where we believe God is both good and all-powerful? For this lecture series, we've invited some of our best professors to give us their best with the following instructions. Help us make sense of our world at the intersection of suffering, thoughtful Christian faith, and your own academic discipline. And so we present to you the George Fox Digital Pandemic Lectures on Suffering and Faith. Let me give you a poem by Robert Frost, The Oven Bird. There is a singer everyone has heard, loud, a midsummer and a midwood bird, who makes the solid tree trunks sound again. He says that leaves are old and that for flowers, midsummer is to spring as one to ten. He says the early petal fall is past when pear and cherry bloom went down in showers on sunny days, a moment overcast, and comes that other fall we name the fall. He says the highway dust is over all. The bird would cease and be as other birds, but that he knows in singing not to sing. The question that he frames in all but words is what to make of a diminished thing. Now that's a poem I've come back to time and time again. And as is so often the case with a poem, I began to love it before I quite knew why. But I was struck by the two powerful but very subtle final lines. The question that he frames in all but words is what to make of a diminished thing. It's a good question. What do we make of a diminished thing? What do we do with something that's been reduced, lessened, diminished? How do we move forward in a situation that can never reach its fullest potential? What do I do and what do you do? Before we try to answer, let's see how the poem brings us to that question. The poet is telling us about a bird that's fairly common, but with this exception, it continues to sing in midsummer. Now, what's the significance of midsummer? Midsummer, he tells us in the voice of the bird, is a time when the leaves are old. They no longer have their beautiful springtime sheen. And the blossoms are gone too, as the poet tells us that for flowers, midsummer is to spring as one to ten. Or in other words, the beauty, the promise of fertility, the vitality of spring is diminished. It's almost gone. It's not a tenth of what it was. Yet the bird keeps calling, if not quite singing. Now in the midst of the bird's, or the poet's, thoughts, we have two plain, simple, end-stopped lines. They draw attention to themselves by their simplicity, but it turns out they're not so simple at all. Line 9 states, and comes that other fall, we name the fall. Let me say that again, and comes the other fall, we name the fall. It's strange for the poet, so careful with his words, to repeat the word fall twice. But because he does so, the word compels our attention. Not only that, but he constructs the sentence in such a way that not only the sentence, but the line, too, ends emphatically with the fall. So what does that mean? Well, the phrase the fall refers most immediately to the petal fall, but also to the fall of the year or autumn. But that phrase, the fall, given all that emphasis, stays in our minds as we read on. He follows the fall with the only single sentence line in the poem. And that's another way to focus our attention. Here it is. He says the highway dust is over all. He says the highway dust is over all. During this lifeless time of year, dust covers everything. And when, in a lifeless midsummer context, we read the word dust and it's over everything, we should recall another great poem, a far more important poem that refers to dust, Genesis 3.19. Genesis 3.19 concludes, For out of dust you were taken, for you are dust, and to dust you shall return. We've heard those familiar lines many times, maybe at church on Ash Wednesdays, and certainly at funerals. 
But when we look at them in the Bible, we find that they're the final lines of the curse on humankind. They occur right after the story of the fall in Genesis. So then the significance of the fall in the poem becomes more clear. Just as in Genesis 3, here in the poem, we have a fall, and we have dust returning to dust. Through this reference, the poem offers us a metaphor. As readers, we hold the situation of the bird in one hand, and we hold the situation of the poet, of the human, in the other. The bird does its calling in a world that's past its prime, and what should we humans do? What do we humans do in a world that is, if you will, diminished or fallen? That's a heavy question. Now, if I weren't a Christian, I would still love this poem. It has a deeply felt melancholy, and it offers a meaningful human problem. But when I let the question of the poem, what do we make of a diminished thing, when I let that question be informed by my Christian belief, the truth it offers becomes, it becomes deeper. The world we live in is in a fallen state, a diminished state. And what are we as Christians called to do in this fallen world? Most generally, I think we know. We're called to do whatever is in our power to further the work of God that God's will may be done on earth as it is in heaven. That's what we pray for. But in particular, that's a tough one. I think about the situation we live in now as the fallen world suffers under a deadly pandemic. Most of us know people who have been stricken or even killed by the coronavirus. And maybe even closer to our own experience, the things we used to take for granted walking to a grocery store, chatting with friends over coffee, or even getting together to talk about a poem are suddenly gone from our lives. Many of the everyday things that we once would have said made our lives worth living have disappeared, or at best they've changed or, in the words of the poet, diminished. We are, it seems, living a diminished life, so I think we can rightly ask with the poet, what do we make of a diminished thing? Well, that sounds pretty dark, but I think there's hope. As believing Christians, we have every reason to hope. In light of our own theology, we know well that even for all the joy our faith can bring, we've already been living a diminished life, a life in a fallen world. And as Christian disciples, we know what our calling is in this diminished world. As I said a minute ago, our calling is to do the work of the kingdom of God. In a way, you could even say that as followers of Jesus, making something of a diminished thing has been the very center of our lives. It's our common calling. It's the thing we do the best. I think we'd agree that our everyday lives don't look like they did a year ago. But our calling, our mission, remains the same. And in that light, we can move forward with the confidence of knowing that God has called us to this particular place in this particular, albeit strange, time. The day-to-day -day particulars of our callings have changed, but the calling itself has not. The virus has changed the situation in which we do our work, absolutely. But maybe we should simply see it as one more complication in this complicated, fallen, diminished world where we've been doing our work all along. Like many of you, I look to the scriptures for direction. As it happens, I find nothing in the Bible that speaks of a coronavirus. But what I do find throughout the Bible is this. I find people moving ahead in faith to follow God's call, even when they have no idea what the particulars of the situation are or will be. I find Abram 
a childless man with a 75-year-old wife moving his clan to a new country, banking on God's promise that his descendants will become as numerous as the stars in the sky. Figure that one out. I find Jacob wrestling with God and apparently almost winning. And I find Joseph sold into slavery by his own brothers, but telling them a few years and a couple of famines later that the evil they had meant to do him, God meant for good. We often don't understand the situations in which we're placed. We don't know why God allows things to happen or how they'll work out, but we do know our calling. Right now, we're looking at our world and understanding our situation only dimly. How will it all work out? We don't know. But we do know that God is faithful to those whom he has called, and now is not the time to doubt our calling, to do our best work, to make the very best of a diminished thing. You just heard from Dr. William Jolliffe, professor of English. He's a musician and an award-winning poet whose publications include the poetry collections, Twisted Shapes of Light, and Whatever Was Ripe. We have more lectures in this series. Check them out on our YouTube page for George Fox Digital.